Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. We're moving ahead in week two, talking now about atomic spectroscopy, which is our primary instrumental analysis tool, both for this week and for next week. And we're interested in it because it helps us analyze for many, many elements in the periodic table. This first introduction to it, though, is going to hopefully review some basics for you in terms of what you might have learned back in freshman chemistry about the atomic structure, electrons and photons, and how they interact with light. So it's a lot of material that I'm going to cover pretty fast. A caveat I want to make is that when typically we say metals analysis, I'm not really excluding all of the other elements in the periodic table. What this table actually shows you in blue is all of these elements can be analyzed with atomic spectroscopy. So it's clearly not just metals. So you can measure silicon using atomic spectroscopy, even though it's not a metal, for example. You can even measure carbon in certain circumstances. Hydrogen is very tough, as are some of the noble um, gases. But nevertheless, it's a very powerful tool that can cover the whole periodic table. What it can't do is give you organic structure. So you're not going to really use it if you want to know the molecular structure of a complex or of an organic molecule. That's going to come later. I've got to do something really difficult in this lecture. I have to explain to you the interaction of light with matter without teaching you quantum mechanics. And that's a really tall order for me as I was really trained as something called a physical chemist. And that means I really think about the electronic structure of both matter and molecules very much from the point of view of electrons being both waves and particles. It's a really fascinating class. I encourage all of you to take physical chemistry and learn how it works. But for this class and the purposes of atomic spectroscopy, we're going to be rewinding over 100 years. <laughs> and we're going to be thinking about atomic structure from basically the Bohr model. And I'm sure you've seen images like the one shown here, which basically shows electrons in orbit around uh, protons and neutrons and some concept that their electrons are particles and that they're literally in an orbit like the solar system. So let me up front say that's wrong. <laughs> that's not actually the truth. Um, and it's much more complicated than that. But for now, and for the purposes of this lecture, this approximation will hold pretty well for us. And I'll make a lot of caveats on this because it's just really hard for me to teach it at this level. But like I said, it's super simple. It'll help you understand a lot of the basic concepts you need to really grasp analytical chemistry, and especially atomic spectroscopy. So in any case, there's three particles you need to worry about in this Bohr model. You need to really worry about electrons, you need to worry about the nucleus, and you have to worry about photons. And you got to know how everything is different. We're going to not worry too much about the nucleus. The nucleus is basically the source of positive charge in an atom. It creates a Coulombic potential that interacts with electrons and actually helps define their probability densities in quantum mechanics. But really what it's going to do is, is the core gives us a fingerprint in terms of it sets the energy levels of these electrons. If you have a different kind of core, you have a different kind of energy level. That fingerprint will be really important. But perhaps the most important thing that you want to take away is that electrons have mass and they have charge. Not a lot of mass, but they have mass. And photons, to the first approximation, don't have mass. And they're really just energy or electromagnetic radiation. And to be really clear on electrons, are, you can't see them, but they, are, they have mass. They're objects, even if they exist in a probability density. And that's a very, very important concept to have here, because what we're going to be doing in spectroscopy is moving around electrons through their interaction with light. Now, let's talk about light, because that's probably the harder concept. And I want you to remember some time in your life where you sat in front of a lake, or maybe you were looking at a puddle, if you don't have a lake nearby, and you saw ripples on the surface. I think a lot of us have an intuitive sense of what a wave is in water. It's something that you can't really localize. It extends everywhere. and it's kind of an object and kind of not an object. It's basically a field. And fields are really hard things to intuit, but they're really crucial for understanding light and or photons. Realize that photons are basically waves. They do have particle nature to them, but for now we're going to imagine them as waves, much like the ripples on the surface of a placid lake when you throw a rock in. Now, if you were to look at that lake and measure how high the water was, perhaps above its mean, what you might get is a diagram like this, which is a classic wave. It goes up and down. It's a sine wave. And that's a pretty good approximation for waves under circumstances where there's you know, 
they're not moving, they're just sitting there being standing waves. And the two important parameters about a wave that need to be distinguished is you have the wavelength, right, which is how far apart the wave crests might be, and then you have the intensity of the wave. And realize that for light, the energy is given by the wavelength. So kind of like you imagine a violin string, another analogy, if the violin string is very short, it's very high energy, you'll hear a high pitch, and as you make it longer, you hear a lower pitch. Now that's different than the volume, right, that you make. You can make a very soft, high energy sound, or you can make a very loud, low wavelength sound. And so the intensity of the wave is decoupled in, it, they don't have to couple together, the wavelength and the intensity, and that's a really important idea. So you can have a lot of high energy photons or a little high energy photons. And whether or not those photons have enough energy to make any change in matter have a lot to do with their energy, whether you have a lot of them or just a few of them. For those who want to know more, this formula will seem pretty obvious to you. You can convert the energy of a light wave to a lot of different units depending on the world that you're living in. Chemists tend to like the units of wavelength, usually the units of nanometers to describe wavelength. If you're a physicist, you're going to be much more comfortable in EVs, and if you're a spectroscopist, you might even use wave numbers. It's uh, all the same thing. It's the energy of light. I hope that's set with you that light to the first approximation in this class where we don't deal with relativity has no mass. It's energy and there's a difference. The wavelength defines its energy and its intensity is somewhat separated from that. So just to kind of go over some of the numbers of the electromagnetic spectrum, these are things I'm going to expect you to know. An analytical chemist should know what wavelengths of light correspond to different parts of the spectra, electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum. So for the work in atomic spectroscopy, we're going to be concerned with near-infrared, primarily with optical or visible light, and getting out into the ultraviolet, although most of the instrumentation will work in the optical range, which is roughly 700 nanometers to 300 nanometers. Again, that's somewhat diffuse boundaries on that term. But for example, in this part of the spectrum, red light is going to be about 650 nanometers, whereas blue to purple will be 400 nanometers. And you stop seeing light by the time you get to 350 or 300, then it's ultraviolet. And so that's kind of the range of things we're working with. Infrared light, which we are going to talk about later in the class, is much longer wavelength, and it even gets longer when you talk about microwaves or radio waves. So really in this nanometer regime, or the optical part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So to conclude, the most important idea from this mini lecture is to understand that electrons and photons are different things. I spent most of the time talking about photons because most chemists have less familiarity with that. Photons are packets of energy. They're more wave-like in the spectroscopies we'll be dealing with. And as they interact with electrons, their energy goes into the electron and helps it change its shape in matter. And that's going to be the basis both for atomic emission and atomic absorption. And the other thing to keep in mind about electrons, they have mass and they have charge, and they occupy different kinds of binding to the Coulombic positive potentials that are defined by their nuclei. And so what's happening is they absorb light as they're kind of moving around and actually physically changing their shape as they interact with light. It's a really deep and beautiful topic. If you had another semester to learn it, I would teach it to you much more rigorously. But I hope that I've given you the basics that electrons are very different than photons. They interact, though, and that interaction is the foundation of our ability to use atomic spectroscopy to figure out what elements are in a sample.